On March 4, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln delivered his second inaugural address on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. The country was divided. The country was in the midst of a civil war in which hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people had lost their lives. And the war was soon approaching its end. In fact, in a matter of six short weeks, the war itself would be over and President Lincoln would be assassinated. As the war was coming to its close, President Lincoln delivered what some believe was his best speech. It was not a speech of happiness. It was a speech of sadness. Many see the speech as a reminder to the listeners that they were so wrong in how they imagined the war would go and the cost that it would take on the nation as a whole and on individuals. The war was so, so costly. But Lincoln delivers this speech on the steps of the Capitol, not in happiness, but in sadness. But there's a mark of encouragement in and throughout the speech, and there is a reminder that exists within the speech. The speech itself is only just over 700 words. And to give you some context, a typical sermon here at Calvary Church is about 3,500 words. Now, I know there's a joke within that somewhere, <laughs> but I'm going to let that joke go. But Lincoln's second inaugural address, just 700 words or so, is packed with powerful truths, with powerful meanings. And so I'd like to share a portion of it with you this morning. When Lincoln is speaking of slavery in the war, this is what he writes and this is what he says to the people listening. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a particular and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude of the duration which it had already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with, or even before, the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph, and as a result, less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistant in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Powerful and telling words. And there are a few phrases that particularly stand out to me within Lincoln's second inaugural address. Both sides read the same Bible. Both sides pray to the same God. And each side invokes his aid, God's aid, against the other. Both sides read the same Bible, both sides pray to the same God, and each invoke God's aid against the other. Both sides, the Union and the Confederacy, want God on their side. Both sides, the North and the South, want God on their side. Both sides want to claim that God is on their side. And this is understandable, isn't it? Because if God is on our side, surely things will go well. If God is on our side, surely we will be victorious. So both the North and the South read the same Bible. Both the North and the South prayed to the same God. Both the North and the South invoked His aid for their cause. Both wanted God on their side. Both claimed to have God on their side. We often think the same way, don't we? We like to think that God is on 
our side. Because if God is on our side, surely things will go well. If God is on our side, surely we will be victorious. A few weeks ago, I was at a football practice of my son John, and one of my friends came up to me, doesn't go here to Calvary Church. He came up to me and he asked me, he says, do you, he knows I'm a pastor, so he asked this question, do you pray for your son John? I'm like, yep, I do. He goes, how? How do you pray for your son John in football games? Do you pray that he would be successful? Do you pray that he would win? Because he says to me, because surely I pray for my son and I'd like to know if it's okay that I pray for my son to be successful. Is it okay that I pray for my son to win? And that's often how we all think, isn't it? We want to have God on our side. We want to claim God on our side because we want to be successful. We want to achieve We think about the assignments that God has given us. We think about the tasks that God has given us, and we want to succeed at those tasks. And we think to ourselves, if God is on my side, surely things will go well. And if God is on my side, surely I will be victorious. But in thinking this way, in wanting God to be on our side, do we come at this from the right perspective? Take your Bible and turn to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5 is found on page 172 in the Bible that the church provides, and I encourage you to follow along with me this morning. Joshua chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 15. Together these past few months, we've been studying the book of Joshua, and we have learned that Joshua received an assignment from God. God gave Joshua an assignment to lead the people of Israel into Canaan, into this land that God had promised to his people. Joshua had to conquer the land of Canaan. And just like God gave an assignment to Joshua, we have said over and over again that Joshua that we have received, excuse me, we have received assignments from God as well. So each one of us, each one of us here this morning has an assignment or assignments from God that he would like us to accomplish for his purposes. And think back over the last few weeks where we've been in Joshua chapter 3, we saw how the people of Israel crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. In Joshua chapter 4, we saw how the people of Israel and Joshua set up stones of remembrance so they would remember how God represented them, how he acted on their behalf in the past by drying up, by stopping the flow of the Jordan River. And then last week in the first part of Joshua chapter 5, we saw how the people of Israel, once they were in the promised land, began to celebrate in hope for their future. But now here, as we continue in Joshua chapter 5, we see that Joshua's assignment is ramping up in intensity. Joshua's assignment is becoming more and more serious. It is getting really serious. The assignment itself is becoming more and more difficult. The Jordan River is behind them, and the walled city of Jericho is before them, and they must conquer Jericho. They must conquer Jericho. But before they go to conquer Jericho, God has a reminder for Joshua and he has some principles for you and me that he would like to share with us this morning. So let's look at what he has to say to Joshua and to us. Look at Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Here, Joshua is on the eve of the biggest battle of his life. 
And in front of him, as we say, said, stands the walled city of Jericho. Behind him is the Jordan River. Now in front of him is the walled city of Jericho. And in order to conquer this promised land, in order to conquer Canaan, the people of Israel must go through Jericho. It is guarding the eastern border of the land of Canaan. So they have to go through Jericho. Look at what verse 13 tells us. Verse 13 says, Joshua was near Jericho. Now, Joshua may have felt a bit overwhelmed looking at the city of Jericho, looking at what lied before him. He's looking at Jericho. We have the idea when he says that Joshua was near Jericho, this means that he's, not, he's no longer in the camp. It's likely that Joshua is out surveying the city of Jericho. He's on a reconnaissance mission, if you will. He's checking out the walls of Jericho, how high, how wide, how elaborate. And he's probably looking at the walls of Jericho and thinking, how is it that we, that the army of Israel, is actually going to be able to conquer Jericho? How is it that we're going to be able to take Jericho? And that's logical, right? This recon mission, it makes some sense. Go out, check out your enemy, figure out what he has, and think about how you are going to defeat that enemy. But his recon mission has a most unexpected and dramatic outcome. Joshua is close to Jericho. He's likely consumed by his thoughts, maybe wandering around, looking down, thinking, what is, that? What is, what is it? How are we going to attack Jericho? How is it that we can conquer this city? And look what happens in the middle of verse 13. He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Now think about this with me for a minute. If you're Joshua and you're near the city of Jericho and you're walking around and you're consumed in your thoughts and maybe you're looking down and then you look up and standing in front of you is a man with a drawn sword right in front of you. Wow. Drawn sword. There's only two options here. This man is either for us or he's against us. This man is either standing in a defensive position, ready to defend, or he is in an offensive position, ready to attack. So Joshua does what seems reasonable. He asks the man, whose side, whose side are you on? Look at what he says at the end of verse 13. Are you for us, or are you for our enemies? Now, if you are not going to run from the man with the drawn sword, that is a completely reasonable question. Ask him, who are you for? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Now Joshua here demonstrates great courage because if it's me and I see a man with a drawn sword in front of me, I'm going to turn and I'm going to run. But Joshua demonstrates some courage, but you have to think that in the back of his mind somewhere, he has to be a little bit scared. The man has his sword out. His sword is drawn. Who is this person who appeared out of nowhere? Maybe he's an enemy. Maybe he's here to help us. Joshua wants to know, so he asks him. And the answer rocked Joshua. Look at verse 14. Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Now we're going to look at this answer in a minute, but first, who is the guy that's holding the sword? He appears out of nowhere. Joshua's near Jericho, he's walking around, he's deep in thoughts, he looks up and there's a guy with a drawn sword. He appears out of nowhere, who is this? Well, verse 14 tells us that this man is the commander of the army of the Lord. But it is immediately evident that this is not a mere man. Because look at verse 14. It says, Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and calls him my Lord. If it were a mere man or even an angel, he certainly would have repelled Joshua's worshipful response. But he doesn't repel Joshua's worship. He actually receives Joshua's worship. So this is not a mere man. This is not even an angel. So that leaves us with two choices. This is either God manifesting himself visibly in front of Joshua or it is a manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ, what theologians call a Christophany. One of two choices. It is either God manifesting himself visibly, or it is a manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ right before Joshua. And this is confirmed in verse 15. 
Look at what he says. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. This is just like the time that the Lord God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Just like the Lord said to Joshua, take off your sandals for the ground you are standing on is holy, he said the exact same thing to Moses out of the burning bush. Take off your sandals for the ground you are standing on is holy. Interestingly, both right before big moments in the assignment that God had given to them. So here, in Joshua chapter 5, in these verses, we have God standing right before Joshua. Now look at his response. Remember, Joshua has asked, are you for us or for our enemies? God responds, verse 14, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Now that's an interesting response, isn't it? It's a very interesting response. Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Neither. As commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. This answer is in two parts. First, the answer is a flat-out rejection of either of Joshua's two options. Joshua says, are you for us or are you for our enemies? God says, neither. Now, I would have thought that God standing before Joshua as Joshua is scoping out the city of Jericho, that God would have been there to say, hey, Joshua, you're my boy. I'm on your side. I'm on the side of Israel. That seems logical, right? But that's not what he says. He says, neither. I'm not on your side, and I'm not on their side. Well, the second part of the answer gives us the reason. He says, I have come as the commander of the Lord's army. In other words, I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to demonstrate my power and my authority to take over, to take control. Now, it's very understandable for us to think that this is Joshua thinking this is his assignment and this is all about him, but God shows up and says, no, I'm not for you and I'm not necessarily for them. I am here to demonstrate my authority and my power and I am here to take control, to take over. His response is a rebuke to Joshua's question and Joshua's perspective. You see, Joshua's response is a typical response that most of us have. We tend to see the battles we face. We tend to see our assignments that God has given us as our battles, our assignments, and we tend to see the forces that are aligned against us. It becomes very individualistic. It becomes very much about me, my assignment, and my battle. And in one sense, that is true if we are truly standing with Jesus. But in another sense, it is not true at all, and that is the point that God is trying to make here. That is the issue. God is saying, I am here, and I am taking over. I am in control. And Joshua gets it. Look at his response at the end of verse 14. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? Joshua's response to the Lord is a response of worship and submission. And each of us need to have the exact type of response to the Lord God, a response of submission and worship. Joshua here quickly got the picture. Joshua had been thinking that the conflict was between Israel and the city of Jericho, perhaps thinking only of his battle, of his assignment. But after being confronted by the divine commander, he's reminding that the battle that he has is not just about him. He's reminded of words that Moses had spoke many years before at the side of the Red Sea. Look at what Moses says to Joshua and to the rest of the people of Israel. Remember, Joshua, remember, people, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. The Lord will fight for you. 
you need only be still. But that's not all. In his worship and in his submission, Joshua always and also looks to the Lord for direction. Look at what Joshua asks. What message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the army of the Lord, the Lord himself said to Joshua, verse 15, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. In these last words of the Lord, there's a command for Joshua to remove his sandals along with an explanation. Remove your sandals because the land, the ground you are standing on is holy. The removing of sandals was a sign of respect, a sign of submission to the person who is in front of you. So Joshua removes his sandals as a sign of respect, as a sign of submission, and in obedience to the command that the Lord had given to him. This declaration, this encounter, this revelation of holy ground encourages us to see how important this encounter actually is between the Lord and between Joshua. And Joshua, in this encounter, responds accordingly. He knows he's in the presence of the Lord, and he knows that the Lord is there to demonstrate his power and his authority to take control. And it's Joshua's responsibility to respond in submission and worship. Here at the end of Joshua chapter 5, in these last few verses of Joshua chapter 5, God reminds Joshua as he's about to attack Jericho that he's there to demonstrate his power and his authority. He's there to take over. And he provides Joshua with three principles that alter or change Joshua's perspective as he is about to attack Jericho. And remember what we said all throughout the book of Joshua, that what God is saying in these stories and through these stories to Joshua and the people of Israel are things that he is trying to teach us now, here, this morning, and today. So the three principles that he shares with Joshua are three principles that are application points for you and for me. So here are the three principles that God has for us this morning. The first principle is this. Who is on the Lord's side? When God answers Joshua and says, I'm on neither side, I am the commander of the army of the Lord, it's not a question of whether God is on Joshua's side or whether God is on our side or not. The question really is, are we on God's side? It's not for Joshua to claim allegiance to God, to claim allegiance from God, no matter how holy or righteous his task is. It's not for Joshua to demand God's allegiance. It's for Joshua to submit in worship to the Lord and seek to be on the Lord's side. So the question is not, is God on my side? The question is, am I on God's side? The question is not, is God on your side? The question is, are you on God's side? You see, we here, we, there's a danger in the assignments that God has given us. And the danger is, is that we tend to look at our assignments backwards. We tend to look at our assignments and think to ourselves, well, this is the assignment God's given me. It's my assignment. And I am going to kind of try to get God on my side. I want God to be on my side because if God is on my side, surely things are going to go well. If God is on my side, surely I will be victorious. But the angel of God, the Lord himself, shows up and he says to Joshua, take off your sandals, bow down in submission and worship, and recognize that I'm not here to be on either side. I am a God of righteousness, of holiness, and a God who calls for obedience. So it's not about whether I'm on your side. You have to come to my side, the side of righteousness, holiness, and obedience. Do you know that during World War II, during World War II, the inscription, God with us, was on the belt buckle of every Nazi German soldier? The inscription, God with us, was on the belt buckles of Nazi German soldiers in World War II. 
This is a regime that killed, that murdered over 13 million innocent people and they put an inscription, God with us, on the belt buckles of all their soldiers. That is how it has been all throughout history. Everyone wants God on their side. But that is the complete wrong perspective. It is not whether God is on your side. The right question to ask is, are you on God's side? Principle number two. If you are on God's side, God will be present with you and he will provide for you. When the commander of the Lord army shows up in front of Joshua, he wants to remind Joshua, he wants to change his perspective, he wants Joshua to know that he's not on either side, that you better come to my side. But he's also there to remind Joshua and to remind each one of us that when you choose to be on God's side, he will show up and be present with you, and he will provide for you. The promise of his presence means that he will provide you with his personal care. And the promise of his provision means that you have access to his unlimited power and authority in your life. His unlimited provision for you as long as you are on his side. Now, we look around and we think about Joshua and the walls of Jericho before him and his desire and his need to conquer Jericho in order to get into the promised land. But there are some of you that are here this morning that are starting school tomorrow, and that's the assignment that God has given you. Some of you either started college last week or you're starting your first year of college tomorrow, and that's the assignment that God has given you. And you're concerned, you're anxious, you're feeling afraid, you feel like the assignment is a bit overwhelming, maybe even impossible. Some of you are raising special needs children, and the assignment has been very difficult. Some of you have been called to a life of singleness, and, and, and you wonder if you can make it. Some of you, God has asked to start a neighborhood Bible study or to share Jesus with a friend or a son or a grandchild who is, who is who's trapped in sin. Some of you are facing a financial difficulty or unemployment. And some of you recently have faced the death of a loved one. Each of these are difficult assignments. Not so unlike Joshua facing Jericho. But the commander of the army of the Lord showed up to remind Joshua and to remind you and to remind me that when you choose his side, he is always present with you and he will always provide for you. You see, Joshua thought that he was going to fight Jericho with the army of Israel, but God had more in mind. Joshua thought that, yes, I'm going to have the army of Israel and we're going to do battle with Jericho, but God knew that he had thousands and thousands of his angelic forces ready to do battle on Joshua's behalf. So when the army of the Lord shows up, Joshua receives God's presence and God's provision because Joshua is on God's side. There's another story, the story of Elisha and his servant. You remember the story. Elisha and his servant are in the land of Dothan, and, and they're surrounded by the Aramean army, and, and they think that the end is near because this Aramean army wants to destroy them, and they're seem, seemingly overwhelming odds, seemingly overwhelmingly outnumbered. And this is what happens. Listen to what happens from 2 Kings 6. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning. An army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, Elisha the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Parenthetically, at this point, the servant thought the old man Elisha was crazy. And Elisha prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. 
Yes, when the army of the Lord shows up, things happen because God has promised his presence and his provision for you who choose to be on his side. First principle, it's not whether God is on our side. We are to choose to be on God's side, the side of righteousness, holiness, and obedience. Principle number two, when you choose to be on God's side, he promises his presence and his provision. Principle number three, take off your sandals. Take off your sandals. If you want to be on God's side, you must choose righteousness, holiness, and obedience. If you want to be on God's side, the God of righteousness, holiness, and obedience, you must choose righteousness, holiness, and obedience. When the commander of the army of the Lord, when the Lord himself shows up in front of Joshua, Joshua responds accordingly. He falls on his face and says, what do I do now? And the Lord says, take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. Do you realize that each one of you who are followers of Jesus Christ are always standing on holy ground? That you never take one step, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you never take one step when you are not standing on holy ground. And that is because if you are a Christian, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. That means that God's presence is always with you. So every step you take is on holy ground. So our response must be to take off our sandals in respect, submission, and worship to him who issues the commands. Do you think that you would talk poorly about someone? Do you think you would gossip if the Lord was standing in front of you with a sword drawn? Do you think you'd sit around your house lazily all day concerned only about your comfort and your well-being if the Lord was standing in front of you with a sword drawn? Do you think that you would drink excessively, smoke some weed, or shoot something in your arm if the Lord God himself was standing in front of you with his sword drawn? Do you think you'd watch porn if the Lord God himself were standing in front of you with his sword drawn? Do you think you would be living with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, no matter what the excuse is, if the Lord God was standing in front of you with his sword drawn? That is the perspective that we have to have. And it is a perspective we often don't think about because we often don't take our sin seriously enough. In fact, sometimes we don't take sin seriously enough at all. But you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are standing on holy ground all the time. This past week, Somebody sent me a quote, and it, it was crazy how this stuff happens. I know you think, yeah, Jim has that quote from three months ago, and Tom had that quote a year ago, and now he gets to use it. No, this is quote I got this week. Listen to what this quote says. Listen to this. People do not drift toward holiness. Did you hear that? People do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, People do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. Now listen to these. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. 
we slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. The Spirit of God resides in you. You're standing on holy ground. Take off your sandals in submission, in worship to Him who is present with you and provides with you and pursue diligently, faithfully pursue righteousness, holiness, and obedience. On the eve of what was probably the greatest battle of his life, Joshua has a personal encounter with the Lord God Almighty. And the Lord God wants to change Joshua's perspective. And he reminds Joshua, I'm not on your team. You need to be on my team. You need to be on my side. And if you're on my side, I promise that I am going to be present with you and I am going to provide for you. But if you want to be on my side, because I'm a God of righteousness, holiness, and obedience, you must choose to be righteous, holy, and obedient. I began the sermon by telling you about my friend who asked me how I pray for my son John in a football game. I told my friend, I said, I do pray. I do pray for John and I pray for my daughter Kate and my son Jeff as well. And I told him as much as, as, much as I would like to pray for success and for a win, trust me, <laughs> as much as I would like to pray for success and a win. When I'm on God's side, I pray that God would do whatever God chooses to do to make my kids more like Jesus. And yeah, sometimes, sometimes, that is through success and wins. But more often than not, It can be through failures, disappointments, and hurts. But if you want to be on God's side, the prayer has to be whatever it takes, Lord, to make them and me more like Jesus. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, forgive us. Forgive me when I seek to massage or manipulate you to get you on my side. Forgive me, Lord, and I pray that you would help me to see how important it is to be on your side. Lord, for my brothers and sisters here, I pray the same thing. I pray, Lord, that each of us individually and all of us collectively as Calvary Church would come to know and understand how important it is for us to choose to be on your side. And Lynn, Lord, help us to see that you're so good to us, that in the choice of being on your side, you provide your presence and your provision to us. And Lord, help us to be a people and individuals who always, always choose righteousness, holiness, and obedience. Lord, we give this to you because we recognize in our own power we can't get this done. So we need you. Lord, we surrender to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.